Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I am your host, Lisa Woolfort, calling in from Charlottesville, Virginia. And as I say every week, this is a very special episode because this episode brings you none other than Ella Clausen, the handmade millennial. And I can tell you, I am delighted to see Ella because her work is stunning and extraordinary. And she made one of my sewing dreams come true, mostly. Let me tell you what happened. Long before Ella was born, I found a pattern, a Vogue pattern that I loved so much. I was making this amazing dress and I lost one of the pieces. I am still believing these 30 years later that that piece will be restored to me. In the meantime, Ella Clausen comes out with a delightful no me pattern that reminds me so much of that dress that I wanted to make and messed up by losing the pieces that I buy it instantly and start cutting it out. Rather than prepare for today's interview, I just decided to make the outfit. So I am wearing the beautiful top. I ran out of time. Judge your mama. I ran out of time. But I am wearing this delightful top. And it is such a beautiful piece. It works so well with all manner of woven fabrics. It feels breathable. The neckline is lovely. If you are a Patreon supporter, you get to see me and Ella looking amazing. Welcome, Ella Clausen, to the program. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here. And may I say that you look stunning in your Emmy 2003 top. I love it. I utterly love it. Thank you so much for bringing it to the world. So tell us your sewing story. How did you get started? How did sewing become something that entered your life or something that became a practice that was important to you? Oh, man, when I fell in love with sewing, I fell so hard. I became completely obsessed. So, yeah, going back one day a long time ago, there was the time when jumpsuits were just kind of coming back into fashion and we're back on the scene. I had this feeling that I just really wanted to make something modern and fresh and beautiful and to wear one of these jumpsuits. But I was having a really tight budget at the time and I could not afford the gorgeous items that I really wanted to wear. So I don't know how I got it in my head that I should learn how to sew and the false confidence that was there. But I went and found a local workshop. It was like an all day sewing machine boot camp. And we made like a little tote bag. And so I learned how to operate a sewing machine and what a grain line was. I literally, I left that workshop and went straight to the fabric store I bought a bunch of stuff. I did not make good decisions. I look back now. I'm like, I did not know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to find a free jumpsuit pattern. It was like a peppermint free pattern. And I hacked it. Like I was figuring out how to put together a PDF pattern for the first time. I never cut fabric on my own. And I hacked it into from a normal jumpsuit into a wrap jumpsuit to match this ideal, like this image I had in my head of the garment that I wanted to create. It was a Reformation dupe. It actually looked pretty good for a first try. I was really surprised. Now, it's not this one, is it? That's the one. Yeah. Listen, it's beautiful. Listen, again, if you're not a Patreon supporter, so sorry. You should totally do it because you get to see Ella utterly glowing. This is the definition when we say glowing with happiness. This is what it looks like. Ella, I'm describing a picture of Ella. Well, Ella, you describe the image from folks who aren't able to see it. Yeah, it's a wrap jumpsuit with this black fabric with white polka dots. I was just so stinking proud that I made something just floored by the joy of that. It's got pockets. I've like got my hands in my pockets celebrating that. And this is while it still looked good, but that didn't last for long. You all, this picture is a gorgeous picture of Ella. She is like radiating joy. You know, like her curly hair is out right about her shoulders, framing her face. And she's got her hands in these pockets like, yes, it has pockets. And I'm going to show you what they're for. 
or putting my hands in and make a cute pose. But what you don't see is part of the larger context. But once you know the larger context, I feel like this shadow here on the left is so significant because this shadow had a plan. Ella is happy. Ella is enjoying her life. And the shadow is like, okay, bitch, I'm coming for you. (laughs) So what Lisa is referring is that um, while it looks nice on the outside and it appeared to be a win, I did not know what I was doing. Seam allowances. I didn't know how to, they didn't teach us in the class to finish our seam allowances. And I also did just the smallest seam allowances as well as like not properly hacking the jumpsuit. Like it was very tight across the back and probably through the inseam. And I did like a quarter inch seam allowance and a cotton fabric. So it just frayed. And like the third wear, it just split right down the center back. (laughs) And that was my first lesson. (laughs) Do you remember where you were? Were you someplace and sat down and heard the, oh, crap? Or was it, did you look at it and on the hanger and say, oh, no, I can't wear this anymore? I was at home, thank God, at home and I was putting it on. And as I was like stretching it over the back and, you know, it wasn't fitting very well, it just split. So you live, you learn. And I haven't made that mistake since. At the same time, I still want to lift up that this is an extraordinary first project. For someone who before didn't know anything about operating a sewing machine, take a one day workshop, leave the workshop, go to the fabric store, buy all the supplies you think you need and then make this. That is extraordinary. And so I think to me, it shows that you were indeed the love, like the love. This feels very much like you found a type of love language. Would you agree if you imagine this in that kind of context? Absolutely. Yeah. Just making things like the joy of just creating something with your hands has always been the big win for me. It was such a joyous, exciting experience. Also control in a way too. Like I had this vision, there was something I wanted, you know, I had barriers, I couldn't afford it. I was able to take control of that and create and give myself something that, you know, it's kind of funny. I look back and I'm like, oh, I started sewing to save money and it does not save me money now. Not at all. No, nope. <laughs> that was my perception. But that jumpsuit did. If you have expensive taste, it saves you money. <laughs> and you know what? It allows you to have more expensive tastes. Yes. Because... I think you're right. There used to be a time when you could save money by sewing like, OK, I'll make my kids a bunch of little short sets or some T-shirts or whatever. But now when you can get T-shirts at Target or something like that, it doesn't really make that much sense. But if there is something in your vision that you know is not at the store and you can create it from nothing or from the raw material of your imagination. Yeah. That's joy, that's power, that's freedom. I love that. And that's one of the reasons that I think your platform and the blog is so beautiful. Can you talk about how you poured some of that energy, some of your enthusiasm and commitments to sewing and what it was kind of giving to you, how you put that into your blog? So I've always been a little bit of a writer at some of what I do professionally. Yes. And so I just had a lot of fun starting to write about the feelings that sewing was bringing for me, like control, joy, accessibility, resistance in some ways, like so many things. And we kind of poured that into words. And I talk a lot about the roots of that sewing journey and how it's helped me, like allow me to feel connected to culture, you know, to my blackness, to my family in ways generationally to reach other people in my community and in my own lineage. Yes. My mom immigrated to the U.S. from the Philippines. She was an undocumented immigrant a long time ago and came here and changed our whole family line and my father's black. But my grandmother in the Philippines would create all of the clothing for her entire family of nine. That was what was expected of her. There was no concept of, you know, I'm going to buy it at Target. Like, I have to do this. She was there in a small village that right. they didn't even have, like, central, like, electricity and gas and things. So that was what you had to do. And I so sadly never got a chance to speak to her mm. about sewing and the work that she did. But I get to feel connected to her in this way through realizing that it may have skipped my mother's generation, but we have that bond and that connection. And I have just like one of her handmade items and I look at it and she finished the seam. So it stood the test of time. Wow. (laughs) But it's really beautiful to be able to connect in that way. 
What is it like when you are holding that garment that the grandmother you never met made? The idea that this piece that didn't exist before she created it, and it's still there for you to hold. What is that kind of communication like? Or is it a communication or is it something else? What word would you use to describe it? It's beautiful, the connectedness and the longevity for me to think that like the things that I might create, this jacket I'm wearing, you know, it's just a jacket for me, but it could have so much meaning to someone two or three generations down the line if it's repaired and held together and treasured. And yeah, that's so deep (laughs) right now, even like with this jacket thinking like this could have or could allow someone in 50, 60 years to feel connected to me. It wasn't even an intention I had in creating it, but something that I think is so beautiful about the power of creation. And it's also kind of funny too, because that shirt that I have from her It like has some random English phrases in it. And I look at that and I'm like, this is so funny. This is like a fabric she bought in the Philippines and it has this like phrase about love and the full circle of it. It's really beautiful. So it's actually almost like a love letter that your grandma left you. Mm. Oh, yes. I love the way you put that. It really is. And she had no idea it was going to go to me, but... She had no idea there was going to be a you, but she knew there was going to be... The slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is that we will help you get your stitch together. And now we're bringing it to you in a new way. The Stitch is a newsletter from Black Women's Stitch, and I am delighted to tell you about it. What do you get when you sign up for the Black Women's Stitch newsletter? You get to hear what's happening with Black Women's Stitch in the Stitch Please podcast. Events that we've had, events that are coming up, contests for prizes, live shows, social media meetups, IRL meetups, episodes of the podcast that you might have missed, as well as opportunities to learn and sew in community with other Black makers across the country and across the world. You'll learn also about some actual stitches. We will help you get your stitch together with continuing education for your sewing life. Oh my goodness, y'all, I am so excited for this newsletter. It's always things I want to tell you, you know, but how? Well, now we have the stitch. Sign up using the link in the show notes or on our website. We look forward to helping you get your stitch together soon. And I appreciate the way that you situate yourself within her line. Because the one of the things I appreciate about your sewing is the careful detail. And I'm speaking, of course, about the wedding dress. You all, please visit Handmade Millennials blog to see, do you have like nine different entries, seven entries? Listen, it felt like more because every single one of those could be a class on its own. It's such a beautiful documentation of the way that Ella dreamed up this gorgeous gown, hand beading trying to figure out how it could have teeny tiny skinny straps, but still hold all of her body inside so that she can move and walk around. I think unless you are sewing or designing or structuring, you don't think about garments in that way. You think about, oh, I'm going to buy a dress that's going to look beautiful and be meaningful to me. I think it's so pretty. But when you're making it from almost the inside out. The engineering Yeah, engineering it. Yes. Starting with your body as the block. There is no block that is just a standard block that is the Ella block. No, no, no. There is one Ella block that Ella manages and evaluates and monitors the shifts of. What I also love is that the first garment you made was beautiful. It was really cute. It was empowering, but it didn't last. And now it seems that you are committed to making garments that will last. Can you talk about how the engineering of your wedding gown speaks to your sewing practice more generally? And then we can dive into some of the details of the gown because wowza. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, small tangent, (laughs) lately too, is how the skills involved in sewing, like literally thinking about physics of way fabric drapes and holds and how garments like fall from your body and where the pressure points and where the weight is held and the engineering and the construction of it. Like those are skills that when we see that interest, that peak in young girls and young boys and whoever, the fact that 
I wish someone had told me to become an engineer, you know, like why did no one see that spark that I was interested in how things are pieced together and that my mind is capable of working this way. And no one, you know, told me to go into physics. And I wish we did that because these skills, I think so many so as the mindset you have to have of constructing things lead so directly to sciences. And we often see those skills in young people and we tell them go to home ec class. And it's interesting because that speaks directly to value and how that's in some ways determined by gender. The idea that if there is a person who you see as a girl and the girl is interested in puzzles and pieces and putting things together, you might say, oh, you should sew some things. But if it was perhaps a boy and had the same interest, you would say, well, now you are going to be an engineer. It's just patriarchy that makes these things in the same way that women can be cooks, but men are the chefs. You know, I'm like, women do most of domestic labor in this country. That's how it's been designed. But when it comes to the top flight, time to give somebody a million dollars for a plate of food, we give it to a man. Hmm. Wow. That was not by accident. And another thing just to add, you would not believe how many black women engineers I have interviewed on this show. There's three for example, who worked together to design quilting patterns. Gailene Fitzgerald, Ebony Love, and Latifa Safir. They are all engineers. Tip Stitch, Tip Stitch is her blog. She is an engineer. It's just like almost like you said, like this kind of natural alliance. If you are curious about these things and how to figure out systems, this is what you're going to pursue. And I think part of it is the patriarchy part. It's also the things that we tend to value about bringing in the arts into STEAM. Yeah, I really wish that we like valued that as a part of women and especially the women who are sewing in the world. I wish that we gave them more credit for the ingenuity that's involved. But OK, you're showing me this book. This book talks about that in some ways. It's a scholarly book it's from MIT Press, but it's by Natrice Gaskin. It's called Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation. Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation. I'll put the link in the show notes. But what she's trying to do is make a novel approach to STEAM learning that engages students from historically marginalized communities in culturally relevant and inclusive maker education. She works with students to do maker things, quilt things. She does these really complicated things that I don't even fully understand with like different renderings and different softwares and algorithms and all of these things for young people of color to see, hey, you know, those low riders that you love so much, that's physics. And so let's talk about that. There's a picture of a low rider in the book and working with the kids. So these things that we're already familiar helps to be the gateway into science. You know what I mean? I just love that. So your blog pays so much attention to these exquisite details. And the wedding dress is just, I mean, a wedding dress is a high pressure garment. People sometimes, Ella, you know, some folks are very bold. And so they'll come up to me, this was a few years ago, on the playground, when this was, you could tell how long ago this was, a playground. And they said, oh, Lisa, you sew. Oh, I love that dress so much. Ella, this was like a little two-piece ITY knit dress that had facings, maybe. Just two pieces, a front and a back. And it was kind of like long and a little clingy because it was ITY. I said, oh, yeah, this was easy. This didn't take much time, maybe an hour. No big deal. She's like, oh, could you make me one? And I was like... Hmm, you know, I guess they don't sew for other people, but this is so easy. I would consider making you one. And I don't usually make things for people with whom I do not share or exchange DNA. So this is a risk. And then she says, oh, yeah, that's great. I want it for my wedding. And I said, hell no. <laughs> Too much pressure. Uh-uh. <laughs> Absolutely not. How dare you? Listen, I was about to be bamboozled into making a wedding dress. I'm so glad she finished that sentence so I could say, oh, no, ma'am, absolutely not. And that teaches me never to fake offer or to consider offering or agreeing to sew something for anybody because next thing you know, it's a wedding. But you said this is the rehearsal gown. Can you talk about this piece? You're sitting, the dress is resplendent. I mean, truly. And I thought this was the wedding dress, but you said this is a rehearsal one. Can you talk a bit more about this piece? My wedding dress is a beaded gown. And I thought that I would make a tester beaded gown with some like less expensive fabric to be like my first play with beading. And little did I know that I was so bad at the time management of this that like I was still sewing the rehearsal dress on the plane. On the way there, I was like hand sewing the appliques on. So it did not end up as a tester dress. It ended up taking even longer 
longer, but it's a boned bustier style top with seven layers of tulle underneath, some beaded tulle that has like these embroidered leaf shapes always inspired by nature and plants. And I love to bring that into my sewing. I love like even dyeing things with plants. Yeah, that's the rehearsal gown. It was a lot of fun. And I think I might dye it like a pink or a blue or something so I can give it another wear someday. We'll see. That's wonderful because it goes back to some of your ideas about sustainability too, about something that's meant to last. I mean, a wedding dress, you don't get to wear it everywhere. But your gown, you could absolutely wear that someplace else. To color that, to kind of extend its life, I think is really lovely. This image of you in the final gown, the plunge neckline, the teeny tiny spaghetti straps, just the confidence of you in this image. It really is a beautiful constellation of all that you put into it, I think. It's such a beautiful process that you describe in six steps, but each step feels like a huge, I don't know, victory. What's happening here? Is this some pre-ceremony photos? This photo, so I'll just describe the gown too for our listeners. It's a deep V spaghetti strap bodice with kind of a mermaid fit and flare through the body and then kind of tight around the waist and the hips and it flares into like a small, medium-ish size train and it's several layers of white silk fully lined and then a beaded, a layer of beading on top of beaded tulle. There are like millions, probably thousands of like these little glass beads in a art deco style shape with some, also some little diamantes. I forget yes, what they're yes. called. It was a lot of work to figure out because I decided one day, I just said, I make beautiful things all the time. Why don't I just make my dress? It's no big deal. And I think at the time I convinced myself that it wasn't a big deal. It was just going to be another beautiful dress. And over time, it gathered more and more meaning to me. And like I picked up some of that pressure afterwards. But that's how I get looped into a lot of the things I do is I think about it on paper. I'm like, it's just a dress. It's just one day. And I get into something and I realize it's more work later. So I was teaching myself from scratch how to drape, how to work with silk, how to work with beads, all sorts of couture kind of details and secrets, stabilizing the V neck, the deep V of the bodice. It seems so simple and you'd think there was a pattern out here for this style of dress, but I swear to you, I have scoured the internet and every craft store and this pattern does not exist. But I think one of the reasons is because the deep V is very hard to stabilize and I ended up finding something called a V-wire separator. So it's a little metal V that is encased within fabric to hold the V stable so that if I danced, like a boob wasn't about to like slip out or something, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was really worried about mobility and I wanted it to be functional. And a lot of people will do the like mesh, the skin shaded mesh yes. in between instead. But I just didn't like that look. So I was able to find my own. But this project took up space in my head for no joke, an entire year. I was just yes. like in my spare time, I'm watching YouTube videos about how to underline things how to like smash the beads and the seam allowances and what to do and all these things. And I just spent a year heavily researching and learning all of the ways to create this kind of culminating garment. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, sewing doesn't save you money unless you have expensive taste. And all of the dresses I wanted were were quite pricey. So I didn't really save money. I spent like $800 on this dress in materials and thousands more in my time. But I got the result that I wanted. And that's priceless. That is absolutely priceless. But also because the fact that the pattern is not something that exists. You thought that you could just, oh, let me just pick up a pattern. I've seen these before. This is a popular style. You go to David's Bridal and everybody has this thing. But that's not what you wanted. And the fact that you could dream up what you wanted, not find it, and not feel like, okay, well, let me just do an acceptable substitute. Instead, you studied That's what study is. Study is sustained, devoted attention to a question. And your question seems to be, how do I make my dream come true? In the limited spare time you have, because you don't have unlimited spare time, you manage to somehow create, not somehow, the somehow is not a mystery. It's talent, skill, 
patience, creativity, all of the things that go into your creative process. And you come up with this really delightful outcome. Now, I want to transition from this, making something so particular to just fit you and just meet your needs, but also meet your dreams. I think that's quite powerful. How do you pivot from there to know me patterns? How do you get from this is something that I'm doing and I'm so devoted to it. I'm loving it so much. How do you transition then from making this one gorgeous, gorgeous, so well-structured, beautiful garment into let me design patterns that will make Lisa Woolfork very excited because it looks like something she lost. Yeah, I think part of the wonderful thing about the internet especially is that I just shared about process, the fun I was having. I was asking questions. I was literally didn't care what anyone thought. I was just creating a diary for myself of what I was up to and what I was learning and thinking. And people really responded to that passion in a way that I didn't even expect or anticipate or even me that I was just sharing about the things that were bringing me joy because I wanted to talk to people about them. That's the whole reason I even started with my Instagram or my blog or anything is that I was finding so much happiness in this medium, like learning to sew and just the mental challenge of it. You know, I think part of it is that I needed a mental challenge. I needed to learn something and to engage and to use those parts of my brain. And I didn't have anyone who could nerd out with me about, you know, bias tape makers or like what an accomplishment or like, why are these bus darts so pointy? Like, how do I get it to not look so pointy? And I found those friends online and through and blog. And it's translated into real life friends. It's actually really funny. I found now four women who are within five years of me, similar age, similar life stage, within one mile of where I live now. And we get together and we talk about patterns. And all of that is just ancient, which is like my dream. That was like my best case scenario that I would find people to be my tribe. And my blog and sewing has been able to bring that to me. The back stitch is a reinforcing stitch, sewn by hand or stitched by machine. The back stitch is a return with a purpose. On the Stitch Please podcast, our new back stitch series will recall early and or favorite episodes of the podcast. And the best news? It's hosted by you. Yes, you. Thank you, you. Do you have a favorite Stitch Please podcast episode? Let us know by leaving a voice memo on our website. Five minutes max. Let us know what episodes you love and why other people will love it too. And if we use your message on the show, you will receive an honoraria. So remember, the backstitch makes us seem stronger. Leave us a message so that your contribution can make the Stitch Please podcast that much stronger. You can find the link at the blackwomenstitch.org website or just click on it in the show notes for this episode. I really like how, as you said, you were looking for community. You wanted to document your process, your love story with sewing and the power of this beautiful dress and all the creativity. And also, you don't want to waste that effort. Also, how wonderful it is to document that. How wonderful is it to have that on a permanent record that you can go back to for your 10th anniversary? You can go back and look at the blog post and say, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I wrote all this down because in 10 years you won't remember. You just forget. Absolutely forget. I remember where I was going out, though, actually. Just sharing my designs and my thoughts, not even about my wedding dress, but about other things, allowed Mimi to discover me. Mimi G literally DM'd me out of the blue, out of nowhere one day. And I remember it was like in February. She was just like, can you hop on a call with me next week? And it's like, is this fake? Is this the real Mimi G's account? It was like during Black History Month. So I was like, is this just going to be like some Black History feature? Like, what could Mimi want from me? You know, girl, you are you. And I was so confused. She saw something in me that I didn't realize that was so visible, but she had followed me and was seeing the things I was up to. And I hop on that call with her and she asked me to design for Nomi Patterns. She said that she was watching the first cohort and that she wanted me to be a part of it. And that's where it started. 
Congratulations. And I think it's important that you note it. You said, I didn't need this. You were not trying to become a sewing celebrity. You were trying to document your own process, document your own joy. Then that work is work that gets you noticed because what you appreciate you can also help others appreciate too. That in the same way that you were looking for a form of community and now you have four people who live within one mile of you, those other four people were looking for the same thing. Never doubt what you are doing is something of tremendous value and of great import and really meaningful to you, which is the most important thing, and then to many, many other people, which is a collateral benefit. So you launched with Nomi Patterns. And what was that like? How does that start? Like you get a phone call and next thing you know, is it like that simple? Like you get a phone call, next thing you know, bam, here we are. That was easy. Uh, yes. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. I'll tell you a bit about the process and how it works. Well, first of all, I'll tell you about what the deal is with Nomi for anyone who doesn't know about Nomi Patterns. Nomi Patterns by Mimi G is a brand new line of sewing patterns designed by makers of the sewing community, for makers of the sewing community by the big four. So the people who make McCall, Simplicity, Berta, there's a new line of paper patterns out that features just our voices, which is such a beautiful thing to engage in the community in this way and give opportunity to folks. So we started with a dozen designers. The launching group last fall were all black and brown designers in particular, which is just amazing to be able to give new voices and new styles and just the opportunity to make it in Joann's and to be at the Hobby Lobby's and the Walmart and to really shake things up. And you'll see the styles too, like they definitely shake things up compared to what the big four is used to doing. There's a lot of fresh voices and faces. The style that I have for this spring 2023 that Lisa is referencing is a two-piece wavy color blocking. It's pretty unusual. I haven't seen any patterns that have like this similar kind of wave shaped color blocking. It's like a square neckline top and a bare leg pants. The designs from Nomi in general are very different. They're so fun. So the process of what happens is, so we are designers. We design the style and the shape, but we're not necessarily the pattern makers. So I will send in some sketches and ideas for what I would like to see happen with a lot of detail. Like I want the hem this tall. I would like this much ease. I want, you know, this to drape in a certain way. These are my suggested fabrics. I will send those to Mimi and the team at Design Group. And then they each season will choose a dozen styles of what they want to include. And they think about how do these different styles work together. You know, we want, we don't want all dresses, we don't jumpsuits. They choose like a variety of things. And all of our styles are so different. Like <laughs> the types of designers that Mimi and selected, we have very different styles and appeals, which is really unique and special and can bring designs and patterns for a whole new community. But so we send in our sketches they're chosen for that season. And then we work with the team of pattern makers at Design Group who actually take the standard bodice block and they create my design. They send me photos, a few rounds of fittings, and I say that this hem the line needs to go up or this needs to go in this way or that shape needs to be a steeper angle or whatever that is. And we go back and forth for a while and then they send me the pattern and I'm able to then sew up myself to be able to create it myself and then take photos that are actually included on the cover and the marketing materials, which is really special to be able to design something and then actually show up on the cover of the garment. And then they head out to stores for sale. It's about, I want to say like, like six to nine months lead time ahead of each season. It takes a little bit of work, but the team at DG makes it really easy and seamless. One of the things I do love, and you mentioned that you take your own images, is that the styling on the no me patterns is completely different in the most best of ways, much better than the styling on the previous versions of the big four that I have seen. Sometimes I'll look at these patterns and I go straight to the line drawing because sometimes the photos are so bad that I'm like, were they mad at this girl? Is this why she had to wear this? Because she looks very unhappy. 
<laughs> Why does this model look so mad? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would hope no one thinks that looking at the no me patterns, the imagery is very different. No, we absolutely don't. We don't. We just feel like, oh, this girl drew the short straw. That's why she got them ugly shoes on. You know what I mean? But this is not the case. And one of the things I love about the no me patterns, I remember being in a Joann's and picking some out and talking to, because I'm a talker, obviously, to some of the folks that work there. And I was like, you know what? So funny. I know this person. You know, I know Julian. I've interviewed Veronica, I've interviewed Neff, I've interviewed Marcia, I've interviewed Brittany. Like, I know so many folks who are the designers for this. And I was like, it's just really cool. And she said, wow, I wish I knew some pattern designers. Or I wish I knew some people who are on the cover of patterns or who made patterns. And that is why I think that the know me is such a really cute and clever Brilliant. name, because I think when the rollout started, it was like, get to know me. The knowing is about ways to build relationship and connection. And so that's yes. what I think is so. It's like community oriented. Yeah, exactly. We're able to draw connections with each other, which is the beautiful thing, too. Like if anyone wants to reach out to me and DM me and ask me, you know, do you think this would be a good fabric for my pattern? Like I respond to all my DMs. Like I love chatting with people. Yeah, it's a really special part, too. Like I'll reach out to Ness and like, what do you think about this? Or like, how does this work? And we can all we can collaborate that way as a community. It's really wonderful. And then you're able to take all the skills that you've built, all the study that you did in order to produce the gown to produce the pattern. And then you're going to be branching out a bit with additional patterns. Talk about the handmade millennial and how you are also working on your own patterns, you say. So you're learning to digitize. So what has that process been like? You just love learning, which is I'm saying. I get it. I love learning too. I do. I'm always looking for a next challenge. So talk about your patterns. This summer, I'm really excited. I'm going to launch my own line of patterns on top of what I'm doing with Nomi. I'm going to sell my own patterns on my handmade millennial. Com. I've got one style that I am so excited to be able to share with people. It's a summer dress. I'm really into angles and sharp lines. And so it's a skinny strap as per the theme of many of the dresses I make and an angular bust start detail, third angled skirt that's kind of long. I might do a floor length version and a short length version. Kind of hard to describe, but I've posted about the inspiration versions and some of the iterations over the past year. I've been taking my classes to learn for myself how to professionally make patterns and also digitally fully in Adobe Illustrator, which is amazing. I think that everyone should be doing things digitally. Being able to make a hack of something and just copy, paste oh, I don't like that, delete, undo, you know, like it is so convenient and fast and nice. And I also got a projector on Facebook Marketplace. And the dream is that I'll be able to digitally design something and then project it directly on the fabric, cut it out, try it. I haven't figured out my projector quite yet, so I'm not there. Yeah, I'm going to try and release a couple styles a year, just using the skills that I've learned through my coursework, through my work with Nomi and the feedback that pattern team has given me. It's going to be really fun and I can't wait to have more styles to release to the world. I think that's extraordinary. And I'm really glad to hear that you've already built in a way to test the pattern in some ways on yourself first. That's one of the great things also about digital is that it does not require paper. You don't have to like, take it and get it printed and then cut it out and then see how it goes. You can project it directly onto the fabric. And as you said, you're still figuring it out. I know you know you're already friends with the best person to talk about this with. And that's Veronica Cole. Oh, yeah, I took her class. Yeah. If Veronica doesn't know it, I think it's not going to be known. That's what I think. It's not worth doing. It's not worth doing. Because it's not on it. Exactly. Exactly. She already figured it out. So I am so excited. Um, this has been so delightful speaking with you today, Ella. I am just so grateful for you coming on and sharing your story and telling us about the rise of your blog, which led to Know Me, which led to Handmade Millennial having your own patterns on HandmadeMillennial.com. Digital ones that we can print out in an AO format. I hope you're going to have AO format because you might not know this about me, but I have a condition that prevents me from taping any PDF pattern. Oh, I understand that condition. It's very serious because taping is no cure. The best cure is prevention. So yes. <laughs> that's why someone was like, oh, I love this pattern. I love that pattern. Here's a free pattern. It's free, but you have to tape it together. I'm like, then it's not free because it costs my soul. Labor. Yes. And soul sucking. I absolutely am with you on that. I call it a condition because taping PDF patterns greatly reduces my will to live. 
And I cannot take that kind of risk. My life and time is too precious, Ella. I won't do that to you. Thank you. I do not want to be endangered when I am sewing. And yet some people tend to try it. And I'm like, well, I can never make your pattern in life because it doesn't exist for me because it's not AO. So sorry. But one day I'm going to get into projectors too, because I have so many AO size patterns that I do break down. I have a whole process of breaking them down and putting them into envelopes and et cetera in my database. And I still have 60 rolls of pattern right now in this house. If you look over there, which nobody is, mind your business, they're over there, organized into bundles of 10. And whenever I have a moment, I take five and I break them down. It takes about an hour at minimum to do that. Oh, no. Basically, what I do is I take the big rolls and I turn them into pattern pieces, much like you get in a regular envelope. So I've cut them up. I fold them so that the name and the pattern piece is facing out. I press them down on the heat press and then I slide them into envelopes and they fit into a small envelope. It's wonderful, but it still work. And I'm like, it's work. Oh, Think of all the Oof. things you could be doing with that time. I don't know. Write a book, maybe. I don't know, girl. <laughs> I don't know what I could be doing. Getting slurpees from 7-Eleven. Anything could happen. You know, wishing that we had in and out burgers here. There's all kinds of things I could be doing with my time that I don't do when I'm doing that instead. So thank you for thinking about the projector and helping us to find new ways to create. And thank you also for having paper patterns that we could buy at the store, as well as soon to have patterns that we can get directly from you. So that's exciting. So the last question I'm going to ask is the question I ask everyone on the podcast. The slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is that we will help you get your stitch together. Ella Clausen, the handmade millennial, what advice would you give us to help us get our stitch together? I think the most important thing, the advice that I give to so many people is to not be the thing that holds yourself back. So many people have dreams of, I want to learn to tailor. I want to learn to make my own patterns. I want to learn to make a gown or whatever. And they tell themselves they can't do it. And there's no reason in this day and age that you can't do something if you have the willpower and the time. Definitely, um, you allow yourself to not let a lack of confidence ever hold you back from figuring something out. There are so many resources on the internet. There's people you can talk to. There's classes. We're living in a time where everything can be accessible to you if you put in the time and the effort. And I would just love to see more people if they have a goal of making a blazer or whatever. Like, Do not be the force that holds yourself back. Go for it. Try it. Don't listen to that voice that's telling you that you can't do something. Figure it out. And, you know, you can fail and then just try again. That is such powerful and beautiful advice. Thank you so much, Ella. This has been such a delight speaking with you today. Tell us where we can find you on the socials. It's been a pleasure, Lisa. You can find me on Instagram at Handmade Millennial. Millennial with two L's, two N's. And the same at HandmadeMillennial.com. Thank you so much, Ella. This has been great. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for all the work you're doing with this beautiful podcast and creating this space for Black folks in the sewing community. I love it. I'm going to keep listening to every episode. And yeah, this has been a pleasure. So thank you. You've been listening to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you joining us this week and every week for stories that center Black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. We invite you to join the Black Women Stitch Patreon community with giving levels beginning at $5 a month. Your contributions help us bring the Stitch Please podcast to you every week. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. Stitch together.